Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Neil Love from Research to Practice, and welcome to What Clinicians Want to Know About the Management of Relapse Refractory Mantle Cell Lymphoma. We have a great faculty today, Professor Toby Ayer from the Oxford University Hospitals and NHS Foundation Trust in Oxford, United Kingdom, and Dr. Brad Call from the Siteman Cancer Center in St. Louis, Missouri. As always, uh, if you have any questions or cases you'd like to run by us, just type them into the chat room. We'll talk about as many of these as we have time. As we do in all our webinars, we have a one-minute pre- and post-meeting survey for you to take uh, in the chat room. If you take that, uh, you'll get a little more out of this meeting. We do webinars all the time. On Thursday, we'll be working with Dr. Enziger, talking about the management of gastroesophageal cancers. Uh, then uh, next week, uh, we'll be uh, tackling the topic of non-melanoma skin cancers, particularly the use of checkpoint inhibitors. Then the first two Saturdays in October, we're going to have two all-day symposia. First on the 7th in Orlando. If you're in the Orlando area, check it out live. Otherwise, it's online. We're covering about, uh, over these two Saturdays, we're covering about 22 uh, tumor types uh, with multiple investigators, as we've done in the past. And then on October 14th, we'll be out in Las Vegas with the American Oncology Network covering some additional tumors. So two great Saturdays coming up for you to enjoy. Also, I was thinking back to the last time we did a weekend-long meeting. It was the end of February 2020. If you remember that time, I remember walking out of that meeting going, I wonder when the next time is we're going to be able to do it. Well, the answer is next March, all weekend in Miami with us here. We really would love uh, to see our general medical oncology colleagues join us. We'll be talking about tons of tumors all weekend. Uh, if you're into uh, audio programs, check out our Oncology Today podcast series, including our recent program on toxicity considerations with uh, BTK inhibitors. I always love to hear about how people like to listen to our webinars. Recently, somebody reminded me about raking the leaves. They say they like to listen to our stuff while they rake the leaves. Well, we're here in Miami. We haven't raked any leaves here lately, but my my experience in the past in the Northeast suggests that'd be a great way to kind of focus on oncology. But today we're here to talk about uh, mantle cell lymphoma, particularly relapse refractory disease. Of course, in all our meetings, we will be talking about uh, un unapproved indications. We're really here to analyze the risk-benefit ratio in a, you know, in a very uh, clinical manner, but we under you understand that many of these uh, are not approved. As we do in many of our webinars, we work with a number of general medical oncologists, our primary target audience, and we have a bunch of cases we're going to show you today from them. We also, you can see, uh, we have a short video clip from uh, Dr. Wong at MD Anderson. We just did an hour and a half program with him on mantle cell, and he had some interesting things to say. I wanted to see what uh, the faculty tonight uh, had to say. But in addition to that, and here's where we're heading, we're going to chat a little bit about mantle cell and where it fits in with our primary target audience, the general medical oncologists. Then we'll talk about sequencing of therapy and management of relapse disease, but also with a little bit of a historic uh, gaze back in terms of how we approached it in the past. But we're going to spend a lot of time today uh, focusing on a survey that we just did over the last few weeks of 55 general medical oncologists and community-based practice. The docs who are presenting on video took the survey as well. We asked these docs, what do you want us to cover on this survey? What are the topics? We gave them the sort of 10 topics we were thinking about. Uh, and um, and uh, we, we're going to show you a, a number of questions that we selected out. But first, just to kind of get warmed up, uh, I wanted to let you listen to a couple of the general medical oncologists kind of reflecting a little bit about where mantle cell fits in, and also I'd like you faculty to think a little bit about what you would say or what you say to people who are maybe newer to oncology uh, in terms of what to expect with mantle cell. But here are some thoughts from these two docs, Dr. Lee and Dr. Lamar, about mantle cell and their practice and questions they have. It's fairly rare. I would say I encounter mantle cell maybe once every few months. So over the course of an entire year, I might see perhaps half a dozen cases. Oftentimes, I inherit cases, you know, patients that transfer care, you do change of insurance. A lot of mantle cell patients I have are actually under observation. They were previously treated, and we're keeping an eye on them. Do you, by any chance, remember the first mantle cell patient you saw? 
I do. It was a patient when I was in training at the VA hospital. And this was a symptomatic patient. I remember very well. I remember even what room he was in. He was a gentleman, lots of weight loss, lost over 50 pounds, mediastinal lymphadenopathy. And I was looking at the CT scans. I thought small cell lung cancer. That's what I thought it was. It was a classic picture of a small cell lung cancer. No, it ended up being a mantle cell. The question in mantle cell that is to me, has always been a question in mantle cell, is, is there a role for transplant? How are you treating your younger patients? Are you still using the aggressive intensive regimens for these patients? Any questions about BTK inhibitors in a mantle cell? Each year, the number of drugs seem to increase. And so we've gone from abrutinib to a calabrutinib to zanubrutinib to pertabrutinib, and how in the world do you decide which one that you are using and what patient comorbidities would make you choose one versus the other? And in patients who've received BTK inhibitors in the past, would you consider pertabrutinib if they've progressed? In many of my patients with mantle cell lymphoma are actually over 65, But when are you thinking about CAR T-cell therapy, especially with BTK inhibitors and now with so many different treatment options, are you thinking about this early? Have you ever used pertabrutinib? I have never had an opportunity to use pertabrutinib. I would love to. It should actually be regarded as almost a completely different drug. You know, the mechanism works so differently. So, uh, Toby, uh, this uh, meeting we're doing in Las Vegas, uh, the American Oncology Network has allowed us to look at their data. It's going to be really a fascinating day to go through that. We have so many interesting things, the kind of treatments are people getting. But this is a plot from these 107 oncologists about how many mantle cell patients they saw in the last year. You can see almost a third of them didn't see any, but uh, quite a few of them saw one to four patients, and a few of them see Uh, quite a few. Can you kind of talk a little bit, Toby, about what you would say to somebody who's new to oncology in terms of kind of what makes mantle cell different from your point of view? I mean, so many things, but some of the things that stick in your mind. Yeah, absolutely. And fascinating to see that clearly it's an uncommon condition, not not, not a disease that sort of looks after um, in terms of many patients um, per physician. Uh, It's a disease of generally older people, um, median age of onsets in the, the late 60s, a, a, a very sort of s- sort of strong male predominance. Um, it's typically a disease that presents with advanced stage disease, sort of widespread lymphadenopathy, bone marrow involvement, often involvement of the GI tract. Um, at the moment, it's considered an incurable malignancy, but uh, as mentioned in those videos, therapy is developing all the time. Um, chemotherapy is generally still the mainstay in, in the most, in most instances in the, in the frontline setting, but we've seen multiple, um, drugs being developed in relapsed refractory mantle cell lymphoma that are really shifting the paradigm. I, I tell patients that, that, that they will likely live for um, many years, but the disease is, is, pretty heterogeneous and uh, has got quite variable behavior. And there are some key genetic um, characteristics to high risk disease that need to be looked, ideally looked for. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating disorder. It's a complex disorder um, and therapies are changing all the time. And Brad, uh, here are the, the topics that we uh, ask these uh, docs about and This is the fraction who rate rate their interest level four or five. And you can see there's a lot, even though it's not a common cancer, there's a lot of interest in mantle cell. As Toby said, it's a fascinating disease. And of course, uh, and we're going to get into a lot of the questions that these docs uh, brought up and a lot more specifics. But of course, number one and two, because there have been a lot of things going on in the last couple of years, Brad, is first line therapy. Um, We'll get into that in a second, but maybe just to trace back where we've been in terms of mantle cell. I, I think I started working with you, uh, you uh, maybe around 2008, 2009. That was around the time the Rummel paper came out. I think everybody was really surprised that BR was better than RCHOP, not uh, in follicular as well as in uh, mantle cell, which of course changed, uh, you know, sort of the sequencing. Uh, we're going to get into more depth about this, and I'm going to show you in a second a comment I heard from Dr. Wang that I thought was very provocative. 
But any comments about where uh, things have been in the past, Brad, and where you see things heading right now in mantle cell and some of the key clinical trial things uh, that are being looked at? Yeah, 2023 has really been a um, maybe as an inflection point in mantle cell lymphoma frontline treatment. If you think back over the last 12 months, we had the SHINE data presented, which suggested maybe incorporating abrutinib into standard frontline therapy in older patients could result in better progression-free survival. And then we go to ASH and the very, you know, the number one plenary session is the triangle trial, which I'm sure we'll talk about, which looked at incorporating abrutinib into frontline on an intensive regimen. And the, the first look at triangle suggests you may be able to safely subtract the stem cell transplant and not compromise outcomes. And then in the spring of this year, abrutinib is withdrawn from the U.S. market. So, <laughs> so we get these two trials that are potentially practice changing, and then the drug goes away. And so um, I don't think there's ever been a more confusing time in frontline mantle cell lymphoma you know, than we have right now. But hopefully Toby and I can kind of clear some of that up today during our session. And here's something I just put together based on kind of what I, I don't know if I have this exactly right, but sort of my impression of what you kind of, as we've been doing CME on this topic, uh, again, particularly since uh, the first study came out uh, looking at BR, and you can see where we're at right now, the, the current, uh, to me, particularly the second line therapy at this point being BTK inhibitor, but also now the availability of pertubrutinib and CAR-T therapy, and then where things might be heading in the future and uh, that kind of leads me to Dr. Wong's comment, uh, which I know is very provocative. And in fact, I got uh, an email. I was showing you, a, uh, I had gotten an email from a doc who said they like to rake the leaves while they listen. This is another great email uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Schoen, uh, a medical oncologist. Uh, and uh, he was uh, a little bit uh, perturbed by Dr. Wang, Wong's uh comments and his uh, proactivity. He's uh, at the uh, 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 St. Louis uh, University School of Medicine. Anyhow, here's among many other things what Dr. Wong had to say uh, during this program. Toby, I'll be curious what your thoughts are. Here's Dr. Wong's thought. So basically, I prefer chemo-free therapies for both populations older and younger. First line, we published the NGSEO from my group. Rituximab, Ibertinib, the response is almost 100% patient, you know, stay for a long time. However, 24% of patients had atrial fibrillation. So, I mean, no longer using that. We just presented the data in Lugano. We use a color and the Rituximab. Very few patients that have atrial fibrillation, maybe one or two among 50. We are using a color and Rituximab to treat our frontline patients with uh, elderly patients. I'm not using BR, you know, I'm using chemo-free therapies for the younger patients. I treat the patient all called in the window two trial with Ibertin or Rituximab, Vinoclast, if they have high risks, because so far relapse rate is almost zero. So the Ibertin is it has, you know, associated with a sudden death, associated with the atrial fibrillation. I would like to use the e burden to replace Ibertin. And I already present the data and, you know, 90% I can get insurance approval, but sometimes in other areas, uh, this may meet resistance from the insurance. And what do you use second line? Second line, I prefer to use a part of burden. You know, and then if the patient relapses aggressively, I will consider CAR T. So, uh, Toby, as I say here, I don't know if we're by 2025 we're going to be there or not, or whether we'll ever get there. And, you know, people have different philosophies. Uh, he's an MD Anderson. Maybe he can access things that people in practice, mm -hmm. and he brings out. Of course, there are economic issues, but we're really here today to try to think about what's best for the patient. Any thoughts about these very provocative comments? Yeah, I think um, interesting. Clearly, Michael has a lot of experience of um, using novel, novel combinations in the frontline setting. Um, I think my sort of initial reaction to his description is that he describes a, certainly a direction of travel in terms of the type of agents we'll be using in the future in the frontline setting. I, my personal view is I think randomized data should be guiding our practice. 
um, we uh, need to see randomized data leading to, you know, pivotal studies and approval um, to change practice. I, I, there are a number of clinical trials still outstanding and, and we're awaiting readout comparing CD20 plus a BTK versus um, immunochemotherapy with or without rituximab and sometimes in, in combination with, with chemotherapy with a BTK inhibitor because, of course, chemotherapy-free regimes sound great, but actually chemotherapy is highly active in mantle cell lymphoma and it's important that we sort of understand what is ultimately the best for patients. So I'd be guided personally by randomized clinical trials and we'll hopefully see more of these over the kind of next next few years, which will guide our practice. But I am sure we'll see the direction of travel being at least covalent BTK inhibitors and CD20 antibody becoming key components of frontline therapy in the future. Brad, I'm curious about your thoughts. I, I always have this memory of you. Uh, we were in the, or I was going to say in Orlando because we're you know, Florida cancer specialists. I believe it was there that you, you were speaking about 10 years ago. We were talking about CLL and first line therapy. And at that point, uh, none of the novel agents were approved. And I, and, uh, we were going back and forth. And I said, well, what would you do if it were you? And you sort of took a deep breath and said, well, there's this drug out there named Ibrutinib. I think I'd want to get that. Now, granted, <laughs> you know, we had great randomized trials, but they didn't come along for a while. And again, any thoughts about uh, Dr. Wong's comments? And do you see this as a direction that we're heading? It's definitely a direction that we're going to test in randomized trials. There's no question about it. And I give you know credit to Michael for doing these phase two studies, generating the promising data and and I think the data would then justify you know appropriately designed phase three clinical trials, and those are either in existence or or in design you know right now where it'll be standard compared to chemo free. So I do think we will get the answers that we all want. We just don't have them today. So uh, Toby, I would like you to get your thoughts on sort of a little bit of the biology of this. Uh, we are not going to show too many slides today. There are people, you know, are going to listen to this while they're raking the leaves. And incidentally, we have a, Dr. Schoen, who listened to that, uh, told me something very, very interesting about how he listens. I'm going to show that at the very, very end of this. So don't drop out here because we have a really great uh, video to show you there. But uh, again, for those of us uh, who didn't uh, graduate med school uh, two years ago, uh, Toby, can you talk a little bit about the biology of TKIs in general? and your vision about how these uh, agents evolved and the differences between them. Yeah, of course. So um, BCK inhibitors, of course, will target BCK, a really critical part of the B-cell receptor signaling pathway, which is you know, active and important in the, in the disease proliferation in a number of B-cell histologies, of course. Um, Ibrutinib was the first generation of covalent BTK inhibitors that was developed. It, by, as mentioned there, it binds covalently to the cis481 residue, um, as do um, uh, acalabrutinib and xanabrutinib. Um, but ibrutinib was first developed, and then xanabrutinib and acalabrutinib developed later, both covalent BTK inhibitors, both with the same mechanism of binding, um, but um, generally felt to be more specific to BTK. Um, Ibrutinib has a range of um, off-target kinase inhibition, which may contribute to, to some of the toxicities we see. Um, and so acalabrutinib, xanabrutinib developed really um, in, it primarily to test the, the hypothesis that they may be safer, may have less side effects, and may, may in theory be more efficacious as well. And so that's why they were developed. And of course, there's uh, uh, robust phase two data supporting their use in mantle cell lymphoma. And then more recently, we've seen the advent of non-covalent BTK inhibitors. Now, these are um, these are different from a biochemical point of view. They uh, bind in a non-covalent fashion, in a reversible fashion to BTK. So don't rely on that, that cis481 residue. Um, and are being developed in effectively in people who've, who've uh, to test the sort of rationale that they'll be active in people who've been exposed to a prior covalent BTK. And on that last slide you mentioned, uh, you've listed a few of those, perturbrutinib being the agent in 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 most um, uh, sort of mature development at present. So yeah, we've seen we've seen activity with all of these agents and development of all of these agents in, in mantle cell lymphoma, which is exciting. And uh, here are the uh, studies that's for your interest. You want to check out our slide deck, which is posted in the chat room 
of uh, some of the work that uh, uh, Dr. Wang was just talking about, this uh, ICML uh, paper he uh, just talked about with the high uh, response rate of the calorituximab. You know, these things obviously affect how you tr uh, treat uh, uh, relapse disease. Uh, Brad, another thing that's uh, an important factor I know you've written about is the time to relapse from first-line therapy. You know, in follicular, we have POD24. What about that concept in relapse mantle cells Does that play out in the same way? And is there a key time point? Is it two years? Yeah, this has been looked at in mantle cell lymphoma and relapse within the first two years does predict for worse long term outcome compared to patients who stay in remission longer. And you can draw different cut points. Patients who relapse within one year do even worse. So the same principles apply. Early relapsing disease predicts for uh, a disease course that's going to be more difficult to manage in the future. So uh, we talked about the uh, first-line trials, or Brad mentioned the first-line trials that came out in the last year, uh, the SHINE study adding ibrutinib to uh, BR, and then uh, the uh, triangle study uh, looking at younger patients, looking at the question of can you uh, avoid uh, transplant. So without going, I don't want to analyze, I think people have seen the slides. I just kind of would like you to maybe try to give us your current take particularly the triangle trial, Toby, when that came out, I felt like, whoa, I could not figure that out very easily. But maybe now that we've had a little time to sort it through, what were the key messages that came through? Can you just kind of summarize a little bit about what they looked at? But from your point of view, what did we learn in this trial? Yeah, thank you. Um, so we've seen the sort of first readout of the triangle study. I think that's the first thing to say. There will be a number of other, uh, sort of um, additional readouts looking at sort of a variety of questions um, within the triangle study. But very briefly, it's a three arm clinical trial. Ibrutinib is included in the induction with chemotherapy in two out of the three arms. Um, one arm is standard of care. So our DHAP alternating with our CHOP, uh, a beam autologous transplant. The second arm is the same, but with the addition of ibrutinib. But the third arm, perhaps may, maybe the most clinically interesting, is the addition of ibrutinib in the induction with the RCHOP, and then no autologous transplant, and then two years of ibrutinib. Um, and actually, the, the sort of key message, the first major readout, um, is that um, the autologous stem cell transplant arm um, without ibrutinib looks non-superior. It is not better than the arm without autologous transplant with the ibrutinib. And there are a number of other readouts which we're just waiting for events to mature from. But in essence, um, you can theoretically safely drop the autologous stem cell transplant um, if you replace it with two years of ibrutinib and the ibrutinib with the induction with the with the CHOP, not with the DHAP, but with the CHOP. So um, you know, we may move away from this, I suppose, historical dogma that everybody sort of under 65 or whatever should have an autologous stem cell transplant. I suppose that's the kind of key data we have at the moment. The other important thing is that the safety profile um, of the use of ibrutinib in this study, um, in the induction at least, and with the two years of maintenance, looks looks really quite promising um, in the arm that doesn't have autologous transplant. Um, there's quite a lot of toxicity if you use ibrutinib after an autotransplant in that second arm I mentioned. But actually, when you use it in induction um, and without the, without the auto and then for two years maintenance, actually it looks pretty good from a toxicity point of view, which is, has actually been the major problem with the SHINE study. There was a lot of additional toxicity when BR and ibrutinib was combined. So that's why we're seeing slightly different, with everybody sort of raving about the triangle trial, thinking, oh, this is going to change practice. And, and people have been very sort of apprehensive about how they might have applied the SHINE data before we found that, that there wasn't going to be a, ultimately an approval from, from it. Um, so, so those are the kind of key differences that we have at the moment. A uh, number of other questions that we're waiting for, such as, you know, which, you know, is the superiority or non-inferiority between the, the 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 two arms with the abrusive, i.e., do you need do you need the auto if you have or does the auto add something if you are using the abrusive in addition? It's looking at the moment like it probably won't. Um, but we need to wait for the events to mature in that in that arm of the study. So it's quite a complicated design. I don't know if I've described it very well there, but 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 in essence, um, ibrutinib can probably replace um, 
can probably replace uh, auto transplant in the future. And then, of course, the kind of another kind of key question is: Will people use a bruise nibble? Will they sort of think about, oh, well, you know, we know that the second generation BTK inhibitors are a bit safer. Perhaps that might be an even better option. Should we just sort of extrapolate what we know about them and and sort of put them into this kind of protocol? So, lots of open questions at the moment. We don't have a publication yet from the triangle study, but um, certainly looks very interesting indeed. And I, I think we'll probably change practice. And Brad, uh, um, you know, we, I know there's a sort of an Acala uh, shine trial, you know, Acala plus BR trial that's sort of cooking. I don't know, maybe there's a Zanu one as well. But there's, I know there's a lot of heterogeneity right now, particularly in how people approach younger patients. How have you, what's your approach been to younger patients and older patients, Brad? Are you still using uh, maintenance R, for example? Are you doing transplant? And has that changed over the last couple of years? as you've seen these data evolve? So my approach for younger patients has been to offer a, you know, semi-intensive induction with high-dose cytarabine. Um, when the patients finish the induction, I offer a stem cell transplant. Um, and if patients opt out of the stem cell transplant, that's never really bothered me because I think it's pretty clear that the stem cell transplant improves progression-free survival, but it's not so clear it improves overall survival when you look at the data in total. Um, so some of my patients will opt in for the stem cell transplant, some will opt out. But I always offer three years of uh, maintenance rituximab, whether they do the transplant or not. So I'm just talking about younger patients right now. Now, we do have an ongoing U.S. intergroup clinical trial which will look at a patient's MRD status at the end of induction. And then the MRD negative patients are randomized to transplant or no transplant. And that trial is, is essentially fully enrolled. We're over enrolling right now a little bit to compensate for some dropout, but I think that'll be a really interesting readout when we, when we get the readout. Now, what to do with triangle? That's why I said 2023 has been a really awkward year because we have this presentation at a meeting where they admitted that there weren't enough events for some of the comparisons between the arms and we don't have a publication. So it isn't really mature. We don't have a regulatory approval, um, but the NCC and guidelines did change this spring to, to say it's an option. So I have not been offering a triangle-like strategy to my patients since I saw this presentation eight months ago. I'm waiting for the publication. Um, if I had a patient who came in and said, this is what I want, I would be perfectly willing to do it, assuming I could get the, the insurance approval on the drug. But I'm not seeking a triangle strategy yet. I'm I'm literally waiting for the trial to mature a little bit more and get a publication to look at. And your older patients, BRR maintenance? BRR maintenance is still my standard. And then we'll be really interested to see the readout from ECHO, which is a trial you mentioned a minute ago, which looks at the addition of acalabrutinib to that standard therapy backbone. And then there's another interesting trial. It's BR versus Zanu Rituximab. So BR versus chemo-free, Zanu-Rituximab. Um, and that will be an important trial that should read out in a couple of years. That's called Mangrove. So standard BR versus Zanu-Rituximab, no chemo in the experimental arm. Then that's for older mantle patients. So I want to get to, and I want to spend actually most of the rest of our time answering questions that we, we got from these oncologists. But Toby... You've had dude, one of the greater experiences uh, using pertubrutinib in clinical trials, as you were talking about before, highly selective for BTK, a long half-life, uh, was approved in mantle cells, we said, earlier this year. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, the phase one, two data in the uh, Bruin study and what we learned about the response and the toxicity of this drug and a little bit about your uh, personal clinical experience with it, Toby? Yeah, sure. Thank you. So, um, the Bruin study has been a very, it's been well publicized. It's been presented at a number of meetings. It's a very large phase one, two study. So, um, as you can see, there are over 700 patients treated. This is a, a sort of data schema from last year, but, um, 
you can see 164 mantle cell lymphoma patients and a primary analysis set, which is a set, effectively a data set mandated by the FDA uh, for patients who'd had a, a long enough follow up to be uh, sort of provide mature data. It takes patients who are heavily pretreated, so median of three prior lines, nearly all in, in this data set had received a prior covalent BTK inhibitor. And that's, of course, the, 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 the approval, um, the, the pivotal group of patients. Um, generally a fit group, um, median age of 70, but pretty high risk features. Otherwise, all had received prior, um, nearly all had received prior chemotherapy, prior CD20 antibody. And you can see that the, you can see there the response rate was 58%, um, CRs around about 20%. And one, one of the interesting things about this agent is the duration of response looks to be really quite um, impressive in the patients who do respond. Um, uh, and uh, also intriguing that the that just seems to be um, this group of patients who are still highly sensitive to BTK inhibition. This is a very selective, very highly selective BTK inhibitor. So something about the something about the um, the biology of of these patients um, is uh, needs to be sort of fully understood. Why patients are still sensitive to um, BTK inhibition, and what is it about this agent specifically that leads to that? I think is very, very interesting. Now, there are some patients, obviously, that just fall off straight away and don't respond. And that's why the, you get a sort of a slight, that's why the shape of the Kaplan-Meier curve for the PFS is is noted. You get a quite a steep early fall off and then a, it's not a plateau as such, but a sort of, you know, flattening out of the curve. Um, but the, but the risk, but the overall survival, considering the, the, the clinical status of these patients, fourth, fourth line effectively and beyond, um, looks, uh, very good. Um, and the tolerability, this is the mantle cell lymphoma patient population, 164 patients, really little in the way of grade three or greater toxicity, um, considering the clinical context. Again, neutropenia is probably the commonest toxicity you see as manageable with GCS, GCSF. Certainly my experience so far with the agent is, is, is good. It's very well tolerated on, on the whole, um, and has, um, a yeah, clear activity and relapsed refractory B cell. B cell malignancies. So, um, yeah, we'll obviously see its sort of development over time grow and, you know, we'll see where it, where it goes in mantle cell and other diseases like CLL. But, um, certainly for now, it's, it adds an extra clinical option, um, in relapsed refractory mantle cell lymphoma. And as, as you mentioned, available in third line and beyond, I think in the, in the US, the FDA approval was, um, was, was third line and beyond. And having if, failed if, up. if you've had a prior covalent, right. exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know why so, it's not approved in uh, CLL, but do, do, you, do you try to access it in CLL? I mean, I, for being I double think, refractory think, patients, you know. I think there are plans. Brad? Plans yeah. afoot. <laughs> we have been able to get um, pertubrutinib off-label in double refractory CLL, yes. So, uh, Toby, I'm uh, curious, uh, you know, one of the most common questions we got about Mantle cell relates. To, we did a whole webinar, as you saw, just on toxicity of BTK. But you're going to see a couple of cases we have of people with multiple problems on uh, covalent BTK. What do we know about? You know, I know there haven't been direct comparison, but particularly cardiac uh, comparison, atrial fib, also hemorrhage. You had a paper uh, looking at the issue of uh, hemorrhage or platelet dysfunction and pertubrutinib versus covalent. Any thoughts about the difference in toxicity more specifically, uh, Toby, particularly these uh, key questions of bleeding and, and uh, atrial fibrillation? Yeah, it's a, a great question. I think there's still quite a few open questions there around, you know, how the toxicity will look sort of with mature data. Of course, when you have relatively short follow up, you get a large denominator of patients, but relatively short time to accumulate events with the with the adverse event profile. So, so with short follow up, that sort of AE profile has to be sort of taken with 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 that in mind. Um, but um, certainly, if you look at the adverse event data, the atrial fibrillation rates, for example, down at three three percent or so, bruising, bleeding, um, actually a relatively common toxicity, but it's a common toxicity across all BTK inhibitors. Um, looks to potentially be at least numerically a little bit lower than the covalent BTK inhibitors. Um, so I think that's promising. I mean, I think the time when we'll get a really good feel for 
um, the toxicity of perturbation versus the other BTK inhibitors is when we have head-to-head -head randomized data, which we'll have, um, at least in mantle cell lymphoma, we have a randomized study that's ongoing um, comparing perturbation versus investigator choice covalent BTK inhibitors. So that that's that's the study, the MCL321 study. So I think that will give us a really good feel for the sort of comparative toxicities. Um, but certainly... Um, Myself as an investigator and other, other others who've used used the agent a fair fair amount have seen seen it tolerated generally very very well in high risk heavily pretreated patients. Um, yeah, the, the, from a from a bleeding point of view, isn't it, that paper that you mentioned was we we had a look at um, whether platelet function was reversible because it's a reversible BTK inhibitor. So we 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 did we did some analysis looking at that with some some platelet biologists and and found that it did seem to reverse platelet dysfunction. Now whether that has any clinically sort of direct clinical meaningful application at the moment, I think is op an open question, but it's kind of an interesting thing whether 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 that contributes to the amount of bruising bleeding you might see with the agent or whether it makes things like reversibility around surgery or bleeding issues easier i think we have to wait and see and see if, see how data matures and, and see other data um before we can be sure about that so i'm just going to flip through some of the other slides because i want to get to the questions from oncologists here's a trial interesting comparing uh, looking at perturbrutinib plus fanaticlex as we go through these uh brad hassan in the chat room heard you your comment about MRD and wants to know more about in what situations you're using MRD in mantle cell. You mentioned as a you know evaluation considering transplant. Any other situations? Yeah, that's you know as part of a clinical trial. To be honest, we don't know how to use MRD in clinical practice yet. Um, so I'm not using it all in in routine practice for decision making. And uh, again, CAR-T and uh, a lot of questions about uh, bispecifics. We just did a program just on bispecifics, NHL, really exciting. And you can see that it looks like there's responses with mantle cell. But I want to get to the questions the docs have. And uh, uh, Dr. Wang uh, referred to uh, ventricular arrhythmias uh, with the Brutinib. Uh, Dr. Morgenstein uh, had a comment uh, related to that. And a number of people ask the question, if you have somebody doing well on ebrutinib, now you mentioned, Brad, it was uh, the approval was removed. Uh, should you switch them to a Cala or a Zanu? Here's Dr. Morgenstein. I have a pretty busy practice, and I don't see a lot of mantle cell. These are cases, if I see one a year, that's probably a lot. There was some information about ebrutinib and sudden cardiac deaths. I don't know if you've talked about that. So that actually shook me a little bit when I read that data, but is this a case where, you know, people who are still on a Brutinib, doing great on a Brutinib, should we be taking those people off a of Brutinib? Is that something that investigators would be recommending? Yeah, no, the idea of sudden death is not is, is, a is good a, thought. Is not a good thought. And, you know, in my mind, I had a patient who had CLL. He had died in his sleep, probably of a cardiac death. That's been weighing on me since I read that data. And uh, Toby, uh, of course, this question comes up a lot more in CLL. Uh, any thoughts about this idea of uh, somebody doing well but switching them anyhow because you're concerned about, for example, ventricular arrhythmias? Yeah, I think it's a great question and um, something that I think is debated. I wouldn't say there is a sort of standard approach here. Clearly, those events are uh, terrible, but they're also very rare. They tend to occur in in males who are hypertensive. Certainly the data that we have from the FLARE trial in the UK, which is a CLL trial, looked at this in quite a lot of detail. And they tended to be in hy hypertensive males who were, had a high BMI who um, were those at risk. Um, now, whether you should switch a patient who's responding well and they've got mantle cell lymphoma, I think is is um, difficult. Certainly in, in Europe, in the UK, uh, ibrutinib, interestingly, is the only BTK inhibitor that's available in relapsed mantle cell lymphoma at present. So I think the question is more relevant, really, for CLL. Um, similarly, in the US, obviously, ibrutinib now isn't available. And so, um, so I think that the, but the question does, does exist. I think there has been a move away from, uh, first generation BTK inhibitors to second gen BTK inhibitors, uh, in, in, B cell malignancy, CLL, WM, et cetera. And so I certainly wouldn't criticize somebody switching because I think there's multiple potential good reasons for it. 
um, but we don't have clear data to support that approach in somebody who is, you know, say, well, young, tolerating, evolutionary well, no concerning toxicities um, in, for example, the frontline or first relapse CLL setting. So, yeah, I wouldn't criticize somebody for doing it, but um, there's not a lot of strong evidence to support that approach. So we have a couple of cases uh, related to toxicities with covalent uh, BTK, and I'm curious how you think through these and, again, what we know about pertubrutinib. But I just want to ask uh, both of you uh, at this point, uh, Brad, I'll start with you. Um, how, you know, once you get past second line BTK, so a very common scenario, patient might, you know, older patient gets BR, maybe R maintenance, second line uh, uh, BTK, a lot of times nowadays that's a Cala or Zanu, and then has progression. So the two things that are sitting out there of great interest are pertubrutinib and CAR T. Uh, Brad, can you talk a little bit how you sort of think this through based on the age? Uh, responsiveness, cell, you know, P53 presence, et cetera. Globally, how are you thinking about a, a third-line therapy in mantle cell nowadays, Brad? Right. So you summed up the two choices or the two most obvious choices. Um, it, it, it appears as though CAR-T has more potential to get the patient back into complete remission and more potential to still be in remission two and three years down the road. So there's um, more to gain, but there's also more risk. So um, it's going to be a conversation with the patient about going down that CAR-T pathway. The, the particular CAR-T product that's approved in mantle cell is actually a little bit harsher than some of the other CAR-T products. So there's there's a lot more CRS and a lot more neurologic toxicity so if the patient is quite old and frail, then I will not encourage them to pursue the CAR-T route, and I'd probably just try pertubrutinib. But if I had a patient, you know, a typical patient would be in their early or mid-70s, and if they're in pretty good health, I will probably give the CAR-T option a try in that patient just because I think it has more um, potential for good disease control over the next few years. So, Toby, you know, kind of putting aside uh, reimbursement and uh, access, you know, yeah. thinking again from a clinical point of view, um, how would you uh, think through the same question? Yeah, I'd uh, very much concur with, with Brad's comments. I think clearly it's a discussion with the patient. I think anyone who, um, anyone who goes down the CAR-T route has to be able to tolerate grade three or worse neurological toxicity because that occurs in about a third of patients. And that is the toxicity from my point of view that is the most concerning because of the, I suppose, effect on um, physical health and recovery over the following, you know, months and the the, the risks associated with that and the, the, the immune suppression required to treat that. So CRS, yes, is a problem, but neurotoxicity, to my mind, is the key issue. And that's that's relatively high with, with um, brexacaptogene. Um, and I suppose that the trade-off there is you have um, potentially a lower efficacy um, profile with pertubrutinib, but you have a, 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 a an easily administrate, you know, an easy to administer, well tolerated once a day tablet. So there's there's such different treat, <laughs> there's such different treatments. Um, uh, this that you know, in terms of, and then there are obviously other aspects to the delivery of CAR T, the uh, some socioeconomic aspects, some just um, related to just the deliverability and the you know, patients needing to be close to CAR-T centers and, and so forth. So I I can certainly see where both have a role. Um, and I think it's about sort of patient selection. I, I agree there's a difficult group in patients in the sort of mid-70s where, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you can see you can see how those discussions can can be quite challenging. Um, you want to offer somebody the most efficacious treatment potentially, but there are you know the risks associated with it. So yeah, I think but it's good to have options. Um, certainly, pertubrutinib could be used um, as a palliative option post CAR T. Um, we have very little data from the Bruin study. There's only a small handful of patients there, but it it, it would represent a, I think a very good palliative option in that setting. Um, but yeah, I, I concur with Brad's Brad's um, 
Brad's responses about these this being challenging, but but good to have options. Brad, can you comment on the issue of bridging therapy to CAR T? Is it better to have a lower tumor burden when you go into CAR T with a mantle cell? Uh, and what about pertubrutinib as a bridge? Yeah, I think pertubrutinib is a perfectly legit uh, bridge. Um, in fact, I've um, sometimes, you know, used um, a BTK inhibitor with the idea as a bridge, but then if you find that yourself in the happy situation that th the patient goes into complete remission on the PTK inhibitor, I'll say, well, this is working great. So let's just hold off on the CAR T for now and keep riding the horse you're on where, you know, if patients are not achieving complete remission on their BTK inhibitor. The data would suggest those remissions aren't going to be so durable. So then maybe you, you take an exit ramp and move over to CAR T. So sometimes I'll, but kind of assess things as we go. Um, to answer your other question, it probably is better to have a, a lower disease burden when you go in for your CAR T cell therapy because you probably don't get quite as um, such explosive expansion of the T cells, which reduces the risk for bad CRS and bad neurologic toxicity. So there probably is a sweet spot where you've got a relatively low, low disease burden at the time of your CAR T cell therapy. So chat room asking uh, whether or not the T-cell collection is affected uh, by BTK inhibitors or pertubrutinib. Someone else wants to know, is there any, still a role for IMIDs? You know, R-squared, we were talking about upfront therapy. I've some, occasionally I hear people doing that. Uh, so uh, uh, Toby, uh, any uh, data on uh, T-cell function and BTK <coughs> inhibitors? Maybe it gets better actually. And what about IMIDs? <laughs> Yeah, good questions. Very good questions. I mean, I think really the only data that we have, at least with kind of combinations of CAR T and the BTK inhibitor, really up until now is with ibrutinib. And um, we've got small series in mantle cell a study called the Tarmac study, and then the CLL cohort as well. And that's based on this concept of ibrutinib inhibiting ITK, which in theory improves T cell function and so forth. We really have very little data from the other BTK inhibitors. I don't know if Brad's seen any data, but I haven't seen any data um, with the second gen of BTK inhibitors in combination with CAR T or even other agents like PD-1 inhibitors and so forth that, that, that suggest that they improved T cell activity specifically. Um, I think the advantages of the second gen BTKs and Pertubrutinib potentially is you can deliver patients to CAR T in you know in a in a good clinical state and and disease um you know reduce their burden um, primarily rather than necessarily this idea that those BTK inhibitors improve T cell function. I think it's a really open question actually. Um, so th those are my thoughts about that. Um, R squared is yeah interesting. We've it's, it's a topical question. We've just seen I think nine year data from the phase two study that was just published in blood um, advances I think only a couple a week or so ago suggesting that some patients are still on the combination it's still on lenalidomide years later amazing um they're quite it's quite a low risk cohort it's not a huge patient number it's potentially a little selected but you know it's clearly active um so yes um potentially an option I think if I had somebody who um, yeah, if I had somebody who is sort of low low risk um, uh, to to try that combination, I don't, certainly don't think it's uh, uh, wrong to do by by any stretch. Um, it's a discussion within the sort of options that you have now in the frontline setting. Um, but yeah, I was struck by actually how durable some of those responses were. So we're going to go into some more questions and get a little bit into uh, side effects. Uh, uh, Brad, I'm going to let you respond uh, to this next case. Also in the chat room, Daniel wants to know, well, what do you think about the idea of chemo with uh, BTK maintenance instead of combining it with BTK? But uh, while you're thinking about that, uh, let's hear about Dr. Malik's patient who uh, got uh, a calibrutinib uh, and had problems with headache and also fatigue. She had the headache for the first month. That got better after a month, and she continued on for approximately six to seven months on ACAL, had a good response, decreased size in her lymph nodes, spleen, 
blood counts, anemia improved. And then just recently, maybe two months ago, she would take treatment breaks in between like on the weekends. And she came in and she's like, I'm just so tired. I can't get up out of the sofa. I can't do my housework. And I just can't tolerate this medication. She was initially on the 100 twice a day. And then I had decreased her and she on her own went down to 100 once a day and told me she still couldn't tolerate it. So you know, for the fatigue. I was just wondering if other people are seeing such severe fatigue. Any questions about a Cala headache? I have had quite a few patients have headaches, you know, with acalabrutinib. Usually they'll resolve within the first month if I manage them pretty heavily and make sure, you know, the patients take Tylenol or Tramadol. But I have had patients that had to discontinue acalabrutinib. So from there, that's why I was wondering, you know, if xanabrutinib and mantle cell would be better than acalabrutinib or they've looked at that. What are the things you'd like to hear from investigators who have used pertubrutinib? Always the side effect profiles. Whenever I start patients on a drug, what am I going to need to look for and manage in these patients? What pre-tests do I need? Do I need an echocardiogram, an EKG? Just because, you know, we're in the community and there's You know, we have all the old ones memorized of what we need to do, but definitely how to manage them and what to look for. I would want to know the response rates and duration of response. And we talked about quite a bit of that. So, uh, Brad, first of all, what do you think about the idea of, uh, like, say, our chemo followed by BTK maintenance? And any thoughts about your experience with fatigue and headache uh, and also your experience with pertubrutinum? I know you have patients that have been on trials. I'm curious what you've observed there. So most patients on ACALA do experience the headache. It's kind of unique toxicity for ACAL, but it responds very well to caffeine. Um, so if you get the patients to have coffee or tea or a soda, that usually takes takes it away or at least makes it manageable. And then the headaches tend to dissipate over time. It's too bad that patient had such disabling fatigue, you know, eight months into therapy. I think trying a dose reduction is totally appropriate. Even that didn't work. When I run into those sorts of problems, I'll try, I'll just try a different agent in the class. So I would, I would switch that patient to Xanabrutinib and just see. You you just never know till you try. One of the nice things about Xanabrutinib is it's twice a day and it comes in. Uh, it's easy to do the dose reductions because it's 160 milligrams POBID, but it comes in 80 milligram capsules. So you have all this flexibility with your Xanabrutinib dosing. So For that patient who couldn't tolerate ACALA, I would have tried Xanu. And there's a little bit of randomness to this. I've had patients who couldn't tolerate ACAL but could Xanu and vice versa with all all sorts of toxicities. So you just have to try. In general, um, pertubrutinib is very well tolerated, um, might be the best in class in terms of tolerability. Um, You know, the way the label reads right now, you can't try it until you've failed one. So the other thing that that, that physician could do is it, who had to stop ACAL is just go to PERTU now because technically you're inside the you're inside the label for pertubrutinib now. And that would be perfectly reasonable to try as well. So uh, here are some of the questions. Uh, we had almost more than 300 questions from the on- oncologist. Uh, one uh, pretty common one is uh, what comes second line in a uh, patient uh, not this first case, a younger patient uh, who's relapsing a couple years later. Um, also, I'm curious, uh, mantle cell in the eyelid. I'm curious, uh, Toby, if you've seen that. Uh, so uh, first question, how do you decide between rechallenge with uh, our chemo as opposed to going to BTK? And have you seen, what do you do with localized mantle cell? Have you seen it in the eyelids? <laughs> yeah, good questions. So the, the, taking the first one, I'd, I'd I'd use a BTK inhibitor in that setting. I mean, the first thing to say is a young patient, they're, they're in trouble. They've relapsed within a couple of years after frontline therapy. So I'd move to your BTK, covalent BTK of choice. But I'd uh, whilst I did that, I'd also be thinking, what next? I'd be thinking, you know, do they have uh, uh, do they have a good donor option, potentially thinking allogeneic transplant? Also, obviously, move it, think about moving to CAR-T, talking about that early on, because patients in the sort of pod 24 group actually have a predicted worse outcome on a BTK inhibitor, but perhaps not a surprise. They're high, they're high risk patients. So I would move to a BTK and think about CAR T cell next, but I'd also explore other options and clinical trials. Um, 
the 41 year old with eyelid involvement only you've uh, clearly been fully assessed and and don't have disease elsewhere uh low dose radiotherapy um i'd use um i think we could debate the dose um but uh it's a radio sensitive disease and with very localized disease in the eyelid i think that's what i'd do if the patient was symptomatic so brad uh, could you comment on again the question in the chat room about uh, using btk as maintenance instead of combining it with chemo uh and uh, any thoughts about this question here does key 67 affect uh, your choice of therapy yeah two great questions yeah so if you look at the triangle the, the btk was given during the induction and during maintenance my best guess is it's the maintenance portion that's contributing the most to the good outcomes um we have a U.S. intergroup study that should read out in the next few months, which is just looking at the contribution of BTK to the induction only. So I think we'll have a clean answer on that. So if you do adopt a triangle strategy in the future, should you give it during induction and in maintenance? We're about to know the answer to that once this U.S. cooperative group trial reads out. Um, your question about KI-67 is a very good one. Um, bendamustine rituximab does not perform as well in highly proliferative cases. Um, it's not a very good drug in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, probably because it's highly proliferative. So that's, I, I'm generally a fan of bendamustine rituximab for older mantle cell patients, but if I get someone with a high KI-67, let's say it's over 50%, then I might go to this regimen called RBAC, which adds in low-dose cytarabine. Um, you know, so I will make some adjustments if I see a high KI-67. So I want to show you another uh, video. This is uh, from Dr. Lamar. Uh, we were talking about, you know, where are we moving in the future? I just had to let you hear about this case of a patient who sort of backed in to a uh, Dr. Wong type approach uh, because he didn't have any insurance. Any, I thought it was a pretty interesting story. Here's Dr. Lamar. Actually, I saw a gentleman today, he was initially diagnosed with mantle cell a few years ago. I watched and waited for a while, and then his white count jumped up, and he started having, you know, bad symptoms. And so I started him on Zanubrutinib, primarily because I was able to get a drug sample. This was first line. He was uninsured, and he was working on getting Medicaid, but that's a long process. So... You know, I tried to do what I can, even though Zanubrutinib, I don't believe, is approved in the first-line setting. So you couldn't get, like, BR for him, in other words? He would have to pay out of pocket. Really, as I was doing this, I kind of wondered, Zanubrutinib versus Acalabrutinib, if I had had access to both, I don't know which one I would have chosen. I was able to get him rituximab for free, actually, and I got him the Zanubrutinib for free, and he's doing great. How long has he been on the treatment now? He's been on for about six months. When you started treatment, was he having symptoms? Oh, it was terrible. He was having symptoms from the disease. He had lots of lymph nodes, lost a lot of weight. He was not doing well at all. He was extremely fatigued, anemic, platelets were low. And now he's fine? Yeah, and actually, I wrote a letter for him to go to Romania to visit some family. So what can I say? I hear these stories all day long. It's just incredible. You know, we talk about the real world. This is the real world. So lots of questions about older patients, uh, Toby, uh, an 85-year-old. Uh, would you? Somebody brought up also the issue of R squared up front in a patient like that. In general, can you talk about management, particularly you have relapse disease, Toby, and particularly your cutoff line for CAR T in older patients. Yeah, yeah, great, great question. So, I mean, I, I think BTK inhibitors are the mainstay of therapy in relapsed disease, and I think I uh, across those sort of older patients who are frailer, BTK inhibitors still have a, a a major role. I think if you look at the response rates from, for example, the pivotal studies with bortezomib and lenalidomide, they are lower than with. Um, Brutinib and uh, and so I would I would use a, a covalent BTK inhibitor in relapsed disease. I wouldn't use a specific age cutoff for CAR T. I would generally go on physiological fitness, um, uh, motivation, so social factors, um, ease of administration, you know, travel constraints, combination of factors rather than you know a particular age 
cutoff. Um, but of course, as we know, older patients have, you know, generally less physiological reserve and, and struggle more with um, uh, s- significant toxicities. So, yeah, but I, I wouldn't personally put an age cutoff on that. And in the in the UK, my experience is that the the UK sort of approval process doesn't 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 restrict in terms of age um, for Takatas. It goes on those factors I've mentioned. So I got so many other great cases. I got other videos, <laughs> but we're kind of sure we need another hour here. But I have to. This is just uh, close uh, by uh, sharing with you. I mentioned earlier that uh, Dr. Schoen, who thought uh, when he heard the uh, program with Dr. Wong that he was maybe moving a little fast. But he says uh, he's an avid listener to our programs. But the thing I thought was interesting, he says he listens to our stuff uh, on the way to work and back, which I've heard before. But the thing that was really interesting is he says he listens in double speed. Because, you know, you can increase the speed. So I thought, I'm like, how can he listen to this in double speed? He really, for all the way to work and all the way back, double speed? Anyhow, here's just a sample of what he must have heard from Dr. Wong. So basically, I prefer chemo-free therapies for both populations, older and younger. First time we published the uh, MTSEO from my group, we talked about hypertension. The response is almost 100% of patients, you know, see for a long time. However, 24% of patients had atrial fibrillation. <laughs> Anyhow, I think... Uh, most his brain was normally. functioning up. Be- <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, Dr. Schoen's brain functions better than mine. I don't know if I could yeah. do that. But anyhow, uh, Toby <laughs> and uh, Brad, thank you both so much uh, for sharing your thoughts and your experiences with us today. Audience, thank you for attending. Come on back on Thursday, same time, same place. We'll hear what Dr. Enziger has to say. Actually, Dr. Lee, who presented in the beginning, is presenting a great case of a patient to respond with brain mets to TDXD and upper GI cancer. So come on back on Thursday. Audience, thanks for tuning in. Be safe, stay well, and have a great night. Thanks a lot, Toby. Thanks, Brad. Thank you.